right, what's up guys? Here we go again. Welcome to episode eight of All Access, the photography podcast. Podcast about urban exploration and going places we're not supposed to go. Today, guys, my very first female guest on the podcast is a girl named Trespass Everywhere, also known as Tui, but on Instagram we call her Trespass Everywhere. She is the author of a very small zine called Not Home, True Stories from Abandoned Places. Another great thing about Trespass Everywhere is that she is also very highly inspired by Jeff Chapman, also known as Ninjalicious, the guy who wrote the book that inspired the podcast. She has the book. She has read the book. All right, guys, enough of all that. Let's quit goofing off. Let's get right to episode eight. Here we go, guys. Episode eight, you, me, trespass everywhere. Let's go. All right, guys, what's up? Here we go again. See what I mean by getting into character? I, <laughs> I know, it's like embarrassing to do in front of other people, but I understand. I respect the hustle. So yeah, just... Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, guys, what's going on? Here we go. Episode eight. And for today's episode, we've decided to class the place up a little bit and bring in a girl. So our last <laughs> seven episodes have been guys so now it's time for something softer something sweeter a little bit nicer to look at and much more eloquent to talk to we have someone named trespass everywhere uh her parents call her tui but we know her as trespass everywhere her instagram feed takes me back to the chaotic days of simple urban exploring the old school way explore first take pics second popping off photos and just taking pictures of interesting things She's also the author of a zine. Where'd I put it? Right here. If we can see it. <laughs> uh, we have the author. She's the author of a zine. We're going to get deeply into this. We're going to talk about this very soon. Uh, it's called Not Home, True Stories from Abandoned Places. So, again, our very first female. Uh, so, you are trespass everywhere. And looking at your Instagram feed from your personal account and your exploring account, you are literally everywhere. You are in the woods. You're in abandoned houses. You're dancing on the street in Kensington Market. You're sleeping in a lighthouse on Toronto Island. You've been in a newspaper. You're dressed up like a mermaid in the water. And you've been biking 3,000 kilometers across Canada over two months and sleeping in abandoned places. So, guys, this is going to be a really, really good episode. Tui, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, I appreciate it. Good. This is going to be a great episode. You are an absolute gypsy or a nomad, whatever you want to call it. You are a very interesting person from what I've seen. And we've actually known each other in the online world for quite a few years. I think you came in around 2016, maybe? Yeah, I think that's when I started posting on like the uh, databases and Instagram for sure. Yeah. So my first question, as I go through your, your pictures and, and, you know, learning more about you, I have, do you own pants? Uh, <laughs> I do own pants. Um, I've started to consider pants now that I got a tick bite this season and I am oh, in a lot no. of uh, long grasses. So I was like, maybe I should think about at least tights, but I am a <laughs> standard everyday dress wearing woman. That's the uniform. <laughs> Good. It works for you. That's excellent. So uh, let's get warmed up and uh, tell us a little bit about you, uh, what you do in your in your life, whatever you're comfortable with telling us, and what got you into the interest in exploring abandoned places. Right. Okay, cool. So um, I go by Trespass Everywhere, but my name is Tui. Um, I was second born. It's a very so fun I name to say. Thank you. Yeah, I really like it. Um, my parents have a sense of humor. I was second born, so I was named after the number. Um, okay. That's a true story. Uh, I live in Toronto, and I've been exploring since I was a teenager, and I'm a writer and a zinester, and I'm newly 28 as of two days ago. Um, Congratulations. Happy birthday. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and like I... I I don't know if I should disclose my job. I work in like nonprofit around like LGBTQ2S plus education with young people. Uh, and I also, uh, I'm living at an artist residency center right now, doing some stuff there that's on Toronto Island, which is super cool. And in terms of how I got started exploring, I think, um, I don't know, as a kid, there's like a natural curiosity that a lot of people share. And I talk to so many people who say like, oh, I went to 
this abandoned place once when I was a kid and then they stopped doing that for whatever reason. Um, and I like to think that I like held on to some of that childhood wonder. And also I like, I think I'm just a nosy bitch. Like at the end of the day, I shared a bedroom with my sibling as well till I was 19. Um, so in some ways, like going to abandoned places was a form of privacy to like hang out and rebel in my small way. And then right. at some point I discovered Ninjalicious's online presence or read Infiltration and mm -hmm. learned that other people shared my interests and that there is kind of like loose principles and like philosophy uh, about right. exploring. And then like that this was not just an activity that people do, but like a real skill um, and a community. So started connecting with other people and now I'm here. Awesome. So you talk about Ninjalicious and uh, your discovery of him, and we both have something in common in that we own the entire collection of Infiltration zines. Yes. Now, have you read them all or flipped through them all? Like, uh, there's so much to look through. Like, I think I've flipped through the first five, but I haven't read them all yet. I've been working my way through. I haven't read all yeah. of them. I've definitely read all of, um, what's it called? Uh, I have it right here next to me. Access All Areas, which your podcast is named yep. after. Um, I have it right here too. Suit. Yeah. Okay. I brought it out too. <laughs> a little show and tell moment, but um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's like an absolute like foundational religious text for me uh, in terms of exploring. And I really like infiltration. Like that was one of my inspirations to get into zine making as well, because mm -hmm. like I really appreciated that it was this like zines being this like nano publication that serve a very particular niche. Um, mm -hmm. and it's very much like hands in the dirt type of publishing where it's like, it feels almost like secret and illicit to be passing around this paper copy of information. Yeah. It's so neat. So I, that was my next question that you just segued right into was tell, you know, how you got into the topic or how you got into creating these zines and sort of what inspired that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess I'll start by saying that for people who don't know a zine is it's short for magazine. Uh, which yes. is a clue of what it is. It's usually a very non-professional, non-commercial um, mini publication. Historically, there's sort of these like photocopied and handmade um, short volumes of whatever, like art or comics or writing. And then for that reason, they're really good at being experimental and telling stories that aren't typically represented in traditional publishing. So that's where you get a lot of mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, feminist and like queer and like, you know, activist kind of like themes and zines, but also just like interesting art. Um, and there's a community of people as well who make and sell and trade these. So I'm very involved in like the zine scene um, and show up at a lot of zine fairs and stuff. So I follow in the tradition of people like Ninjalicious, whose um, wife, Liz, I still see around at zine fairs. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's really cool. So uh, it's nice. And like when I got the full box set of Infiltration, um, it was like directly from Liz, who's still selling it. So same. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, <laughs> yeah, I I was introduced to zines through Infiltration as well as through like online. Like I was a Tumblr kid. So I saw some zines there and started making them in high school with my school's um, GSA, the Gender and Sexuality Alliance. So a lot of it was like other young queer kids I knew who were creating art. We had an early zine that was called the Out Student Survival Guide. So uh, it was like tips we had learned along the way of like, if you're going to be an out LGBTQ 2S plus person at school, like how we're going to make it out of here. Um, <laughs> and I still have some of those. Um, and I have other zines that I have written and are in the works as well. So I hope to make zines for the rest of my life. That's so cool. It's And it's so like not something you would think to do these days in the digital age. So it's really cool that you've kept that alive. Thank you. Yeah. Like yeah. when it comes to exploring, like I listened to your episode with Greg Abandoned uh, mm -hmm. and make respect for him too. And he talked about like the pre-Instagram era of exploring, like before a picture had to be worth a thousand words, like now, and you know, yeah. it's really cool. like you have one millisecond to get someone to stop scrolling and like, you can't take too much of their time either. You Like your captions are very succinct yeah. bites and he said he sort of misses the time when people had zines or blogs and you waited for the update and it was also a tale about the journey and that's what i like to feel like i'm doing yeah and that's how that's how i am with my website like you know my facebook page and my website are where i'll put longer form sort of captions and stories but on instagram you know 
Sometimes I will put a longer caption on Instagram, but nobody's reading it. <laughs> I read yeah. them. So good. Uh, thank you. <laughs> you. All right. So let's get to uh, your zine, which is called again, not home for everyone watching and listening. I am going to put a link so you can buy to zine down below. I will also put a link as I always do to buy access all areas. And I'll also drop a link to get the um, infiltration zines as well. But I want to hear about what inspired this. There is uh, two or three different stories. Your, your writing is fantastic. I will Thank say you. very, very creative writing and it's really captured my attention. Um, so I want to hear what is the, the, the locations and the experiences that, that inspired this. And I will say before I give you the, 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 the time to talk again, we talk about this whole, uh, unwritten rule of take nothing but photos, but I and myself have, uh, fallen victim to this and I've not victim, but I've taken things out. I found, I found war medals and I'm like, I'm not leaving these behind. Uh, I did leave them behind my first time I went, I got home and I fully regretted it. And, um, I went back to take them so that I could return them to the family only to find that someone else had har already stolen them. They didn't take them for, uh, the right purposes. They took them for their own benefit. I tracked this person down and I got them back. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And tried to return. And it's a very long story that we're not here to talk about me. We're here to talk about you, but I have on occasion, uh, removed an item or items from an abandoned place with an intention right? Of, uh, of doing the right thing. And, uh, so I'm very curious to hear how this came to be and, uh, <laughs> the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah. I love that your first question was like, why are you a thief? I feel like I gave a false impression <laughs> with my uh, collection because I do have like a, I try and follow that, like, you know, take nothing but pictures, leave nothing but footprints philosophy. And I, I do stand by that. I've stopped exploring with some people in the past who I felt were like a little bit too, like, grabby or they had their eyes on stuff and I was like that's not really why we're here um right but I'm pretty sure three out of the four stories in this collection involve me taking something from a place um yeah with you know some like inner conflict and like I try and keep a code of integrity around that um totally. but it's because like things that I found in these places were so remarkable and like were otherwise just gonna like rot and be lost to time and were things that I think bared like you know some like impetus to like honor in their own way. So yes. um, yeah, Not Home, it's a uh, essay collection, creative essay about four different special places I've visited of the many places that I've visited over the years. And originally mm -hmm. I wanted to make it more of a field guide. Like I wanted to take like a closer model to infiltration, but then um, first of all, I come from a poetry and writing background. So I was like, I don't know. Very I obvious. Yeah. Way. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I also felt that I couldn't really divorce the spaces I visited from the context of not only like what had happened while I was there, but also kind of the meta narrative in my own life. Um, so like the stories are very personalized. You hear a lot about myself as opposed to just the locations alone. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And the first story is about, um, Norman Elders Explorers Club, which I'm sure you'll ask me about later, which was like this abandoned compound of a millionaire eccentric. Um, mm -hmm. That was like one of the earliest places that I remember like impressing upon me, like I have to explore, like I have to yeah. keep doing this. Um, the second story is everyone's favorite from the collection, which is about uh, prison love letters I found in a barn um, that were yeah. written in the 80s and 90s. Um, and beautiful story. I still have those letters, um, lots of plot twists, um, in mm -hmm. what I read and, um, an update on that to come. Okay. Uh, the third one is called song of the butcher's son. And it's about, um, it's, there's a few different threads running through it. Um, predominantly it has to do with a tape that I found in uh, an abandoned like butcher's shop that was also in someone's house. Yeah. Um, and his son had a briefcase full of handwritten songs. And near that briefcase was a tape that I believe would be his own music. It was a home recorded like grunge tape, um, mm -hmm. like sort of like 1990, whatever. Uh, yeah. And also that story deals with like mental health and like um, my experience, like being a psychiatric inpatient and like making comparisons between that and the content that I was like exploring that house. 
And then the last story is just about a pretty unremarkable place um, that I called Ronnie's house, which is kind of using that setting to like, you know, identify the different methodologies of trespassing and how every person who explores a place sees something different. And that like how Mm -hmm. they see tells us more about the story of them than it does even the story of that place. Awesome. It's it's, it's such a such a fascinating read. And that's funny because I read about how you found the cassette and it had a listing of the songs on it. And here you think you're going to go home and listen to Crying by Aerosmith. And then you got some dude playing his guitar. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was shocked. <laughs> it, it's so neat. And, and, I, and I, I, I do believe that like everybody takes things every once in a while. I used to take skeleton keys just because I think they're fascinating and they're neat to have. But if the reason why you're you're taking something, it's for a very good reason. And um, it, it, it brings up a whole thing, you know, taking things versus not taking things. And you know what? At the end of the day, nobody's going back for those letters. Nobody's going back for those tapes. It's not like you're walking out with, you know, grandma's jewelry that the family might be going back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And I don't, I don't, uh, I think you've done the absolute right thing in putting this together. Um, the Norman Elder Cottage, I never got to. It was demolished and torn down before I figured out where it was. And it's thanks to people like you who documented it so well. And what I remember the story of you going to that um, oddity store in Toronto. Yeah. And that you found someone who knew Norman Elder and had possibly had some of his stuff. Yeah. Like this Norman Elder story has followed me for 10 years now. It's like, I can't get rid of it. <laughs> Um, yeah. And I think what like was most, accept- there's so many things that have been revealed to me in the years since about what was particularly special about that place. One of them being that yeah. very few people got to explore it. Um, and I had people message me when I posted photos of it finally in like 2017 or whatever, being like, how did you go to this place? Like who told you about this place? And I was like, no one told me uh-huh. about this place. Like it was actually a total accident that I even found it at all. Like there was no location scouting. I was just visiting a cottage with friends and yeah. yeah we just like discovered it um and yeah for anyone who doesn't know it's like this millionaire's cottage super bizarre place there's like you know t- all these little buildings that are out, like made out of these cobbled together materials and like mm-hmm. if, like i used to play these like like i spy type games like point yeah. and click on, on the pc <laughs> when i was a kid yeah. and it looked like one of those games it was like, it was, if I had seen it in a video game, I might have like thought it was unrealistic. But anyways, um, yeah. yeah, visiting that place was like super bizarre. And we each took, um, in the end, from this room of like scrapbooks that he had from the uh, like 40s up to the 90s, um, mm-hmm. we each took one. And then when we got yeah. home, we found the guy's wikipedia page we googled him it was clear he was a public figure because he had like brochures around of when he ran for alderman and he had like signs right. for norman elders museum like this was like a, a famous toronto eccentric dude it, yeah yeah um and so yeah when we looked up his wikipedia page we saw that he had um killed himself in mm. 2001 i think um and so my friends became super superstitious and were like i don't want this album ah, i get it away from me so i was left with three albums that I hid in my shared bedroom with my sibling, who was also very unhappy to discover them in our room because (laughs) they feared ghosts, but I have not been haunted by it to my knowledge, except for the fact that the elements of the story keep popping up in my life. And one of them is that, um, yeah, I I arrived at this, like, which was also an accident. I was biking through Regent Park and just passed this place that was like dino shop in huge letters. I was like, skirt, what the hell's that? And pulled over. (laughs) And inside there was like an old magician of a certain age and he was in this oddity store. And I was like, hey, do you by chance know a guy by the name of Norman Elder? And he was like, yeah, why? I was like, yeah, why? (laughs) What? This story has been like, this is a mythical figure to me. Like, yeah, why? And he was like, "Yeah, yeah, you know. The, oh, there's only so many old weird collector guys in Toronto and I knew him he was super weird dude super weird even among weirdos um and there was always this kind of mystery like outstanding of 
what happened to all this guy's stuff because there was so much stuff in that place like real historical artifacts and he had his own museum on um uh, not Borden Street whatever it was in Toronto and it was like he had like a Galapagos turtle in it and like rare snakes and like wow you know there are photos of the place in his scrapbook so I brought the scrapbooks to this magician dude and he mm-hmm. looked it over and he was just like, yeah, I have been to his house. I remember this room. He said like, oh, this room, that's you can barely see the walls. He's like, that must have been an earlier photo because when I went, it was even more full of stuff. Wow. It was his Toronto home. Um, but the place that I went that was in like, um, like near Muskoka, um, yeah. he had never heard of. Apparently, hmm, this was that was like a little bit secret. And so the curator for the museum came by and started telling me about his experience with Norman Elder, which was that um, like... Uh, it, so he he died in 2001 and then around 2003 um a lot of his stuff came into the possession of billy jameson who has his own story billy jameson is like this collector dude he was wandering around niagara falls high on ayahuasca and found himself inside the niagara museum which was also an oddities museum and it was closed at the time and the owner well not even the owner the owner's son was like sitting in there and was like hey man you can't be in here um and the guy was like what is this place and then the guy started explaining like you know uh, this was my dad's museum and he just died i don't know how to get rid of all the stuff and billy jameson was like well i'll buy it um and the guy was like i'll sell you everything in here for like a hundred thousand dollars or a million wow. whatever whatever the price was it was like he severely undersold it because one of the artifacts in that museum was the literal mummy of king ramses of egypt i remember then- that when i was a kid yeah <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. So, um, yeah, and he just became a total, this Billy Jameson guy became, you know, like a, a name, the next name in the long line of Toronto centric dudes. He like partied with Mick Jagger and whatever. Um, and yeah. so he acquired a lot of Norman Elder stuff. And then that Oddities Museum in Regent Park acquired most of Billy Jameson's stuff. So it's like, mm. you can kind of see provenance. Um, and it was really interesting that I'm like, oh, wow, I'm standing in a room again of like all Norman Elder stuff, like totally by That's accident. So crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds fake. Like I almost worried about telling people. Like, I think people think I'm a liar, but <laughs> that's nuts that you you found this place by fluke. And I remember the secrecy surrounding this place, and that a few others had been there, and no one would give it out, which is the way it goes. And then, of course, like no one would think that you found it on your own. But that's there are other people out looking for places too, other than these guys, you know. Yeah, and so yeah. that you you find you find it, and it completely takes over you. you and then it follows you. It's just such an interesting story. And I will say to the listeners to go to Trespass Everywhere on Instagram and just start scrolling through her posts and reading captions. And you'll see the whole like progression of, of this transpiring from years ago all the way up to even more recently. I highly recommend it. It's a, it's a pretty fascinating story. And then there's lots about it inside her zine, which is, again, called Not Home. So let's move on to... Um, other than, let's say, other than the, the Norman Elder Cottage uh, and the ones that are in the zine, what are some of your favorite explorers that you've done over the years? And you've been to many. So what are some of your favorites? Yeah, I'm trying to think. I had like, actually, a, I'm going to pull out my phone because I recently tried to make a top 10 list of my favorite oh, explorers, which is hard to okay. make. Um, <laughs> it is a hard question when you've done so much. Yeah, okay. Uh, a lot of them as well, like, I try and stick to the old school philosophy of urban exploration, which focuses not exclusively on abandoned places and is more interested in like, you know, it's become synonymous with abandoned places or even just like rooftops and drains, but there's, that's just a small corner of what it could be. Um, In terms of, yeah, one of my favorite explorers was um, the Canada Malting Co. plant um, on the lakeshore in Toronto Mm -hmm. because I live up the street also because um, it was really fun. It's not accessible anymore. It was really fun to get right. in though. We had to take like, uh, go over two fences and like, I stayed there overnight, um, a couple of times yeah. there on Victoria day weekend. So I got to see fireworks from up top of there oh, and, um, so cool. yeah, we had to climb a rope into it. Um, yeah, it, it was just like such a, like a amazing relic of toronto like everyone has seen it and so a few people have like seen it from the inside except when it was active yeah. there's like the huge like um vats that they would drain the mall whatever's in and underground tunnels yeah. and full of asbestos 
Um, <laughs> but yeah, super memorable for like the, the vastness of what it was. And also the fact that mm -hmm. I like had a really sick sleepover and like had some really fun times there, just like looking at the view with friends and it was nice. Yeah. Good. Yeah. That did you ever see, uh, since they started the, the renovations of it, somebody mm -hmm. discovered there's a hole in one of the silos. Okay. So there's yes. a very small hole and then the hole created a pinhole camera effect and it actually makes an inverted, uh, video sort of on the yes. other wall of what's going on outside. There's an article. If you look up, I think it's on blog to, if you look yes. up Canada malting pinhole camera, there's yeah, actually pictures and video of it. It's so neat. The little tiny hole. And when the light hits it right, it actually uh, projects what's going on outside on the opposite wall. Yeah. Whoa, that's so sick. I wonder how <laughs> yeah, someone found really it out. <laughs> I yeah, wish I, I saw it when I was there because I, I spent a bit of time in the silos just looking around and I didn't see that. I really wish I would have seen that. But um, yeah, when you were in, you had to climb the, the, the rope and then... Um, well, I think it was a one or two years ago, finally a door opened. And after years of the only way to get up being climbing up a rope, there was finally a door open, which was much easier. And I managed to get in a few times bef just before the construction started and all the scaffolding mm -hmm. went up. So I haven't put that out yet, but yeah, it's uh, that was a really good one. Um, have you ever hurt, hurt yourself? Ooh, good question. Falling through good a floor? Or... Yeah. I've never fell through a floor. No, I have to say I'm pretty fortunate. I'm also, um, I try not to be reckless. I've swung yeah. and jumped before, but I haven't like, you know, put my full weight on anything. <laughs> oh, another so favorite just, place um, that I should mention is like, um, and ugh, this is another example of a place where I meddled. And I think I even went to you for advice about whether mm -hmm. I should meddle or not. But this was a, yeah. another example where I did. Decide to, um, there was, uh, I, I don't know if I'm supposed to say the name of this place. I'll say it and you can cut it out if it's not allowed. Sure, uh, sure. Or like, you can use your judgment, but the Lee house, um, yes. where it's like the yes. writing on the wall of like, you know, the pastor who went rogue and yes. started being obsessed with like the devil and had his uh, so weird. roadkill. Yes. Um, yeah, super freaky place. And uh, other people have noted that it's full of tapes, recordings. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I did bring a cassette player and listen to a lot of the recordings and some yeah. of them were really freaky. It was like the son who inherited the place was, I think a bit of like an odd fellow. Um, mm -hmm. there was one recording where he's like, uh, this, someone else recorded this, but he's speaking to some like social services agent about like his life. And she asks, are you married? And he says something like, no, no, never been married. You know, six years old. I had a girlfriend one time though, but uh, she didn't know she was my girlfriend. It's like. That sounds kind of stalker. I don't know about yeah. that. Um, and then other weird stuff. He had like a, a, a tape called like Mouse Caught in Trap. And it was just like the sound of a mouse dying. So scary. And then he just had like old school, like basically the equivalent of like 1960s vlogs where it would just be like, George walks to the hardware store. And it'd be like two hours of his footsteps. And then like him being like, oh, I don't remember nails. Um, but the tape oh, that I ended up uh, taking was this one that was recorded by like the father, the, the pastor who went rogue. Um, and he was interviewing his high school students in Alberta in like 1950, whatever, um, and asking them what they wanted to be when they grew up. And for a lot of them, it was their first time speaking into like a recording device. So he's also coaching mm. them on like how to do that. And their answers were so sweet. And I was kind of thinking about the fact that I was like, a lot of these people are probably still alive and really old now. Since yeah like in the 50s and I thought how like I was wondering if they did become the thing that they said they wanted to be and uh -huh. with much deliberation I ended up anonymously sending the tape to the high school um oh, cool. wow. yeah, so the principal, he was super excited he wrote back like you know I want the students to do like an interview project with the alumni who are now like aging and ask them like how their lives turned out and play this back to them um mm -hmm. and it ended up being really a positive experience so uh, See, I it's, such, it's so creative the, the way that you, you find something and, and how you turn it into something. That's such a, I would have never thought to send it back to the school. What a good idea. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
so who do you get inspiration from in terms of like, you know, you, again, you've been in the hobby for quite a while. So who do you get inspiration from? Or who are some of your sort of favorite uh, people to follow? Hmm. Well, I am tempted not to name, although like I respect you, Dave, as well. And like a lot of like folks <laughs> on Instagram who like I like rock with and have for a long time. Uh, yeah. I feel like my like most prominent inspirations are people who like I could name and you have would have no idea who they are like they have no oh interesting um okay well that's really cool yeah like I especially respect like and also like a lot of other like women queer and trans people who do the same things like I have a friend who um free soloed the Eiffel Tower oh my god literally just climbed up rogue and yeah it was insane and has barely even told the story to anyone. And I heard was lucky enough to hear the story one time because it's something that like they had a strong value not to like turn into this like brag thing, right? Um, which yeah. was super cool. And I have a friend who's like really good at social engineering type stuff that like Ninja talks about of like weaseling your way into spaces. Um, yes. And I have a lot of like activist and hacktivist type friends who enter all kinds of spaces for like, you know, di- physical or digital spaces for great social purpose. So um, when I think of the great urban explorers and trespassers, those come to mind. Like even like, um, I don't know if you've heard of Maya Arson Crime You. No. She's like no. a huge hacker. She's like a Swedish, Norwegian, um, like lesbian, trans girl activist okay. who like hacked bat- databases and uh, leaked the U.S. no fly list. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is i would say like that's trespassing like that's urban exploration totally. like you, yeah you, you parse through like the the digits of like you know the wilderness and like made that happen so uh yeah i like to think of urban exploration and like the, the big umbrella um see what's awesome about you that way is that you know a lot of times when i when i talk to people or if i bring it up nobody is interested in the history or like the, you know, like the beginnings of urban exploration or like the deep, deeper side of it. And not a lot of people have even read the book. And that's one of the things I really admire about you is that you've got such a respect for that side of it. You know, you have the book, you have the zines and even like what you just said about some of the inspiration that you take from, from people who do this stuff and don't brag about it. Like I do, (laughs) you know, like (laughs) I wish more people, like I wrote a little book about it. So, you know, Everybody has to <laughs> hear the story somehow. Um, yeah. yeah, but I wish more cool. people were like you. I, I wish more people. You're you're almost like a like an older soul in a in a in a much younger person's body, younger comparative to me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I I wish more people would have the interest in the origins of the hobby and the deeper thinking of the hobby. Uh, that's you know, and while I may not necessarily practice all that that stuff so much these days, I I did when I started or throughout my my time. Anyways, I'm going on and on and on. You brought up a good point and something that we talked about off camera was that you are the first female explorer that I've talked to on the podcast. And I would like to know what's it like in a, in a hobby full of bearded tattooed dudes, (laughs) what's it like to be a female in the urban exploration hobby? And, you know, it is, it is very heavily male dominant in this hobby. And while Mm. there are quite a few more women coming out here and there, uh, just let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, like you said, it's not a secret that all like the biggest YouTubers and ex- photographers and like influencers, so to speak, are men. Um, mm-hmm. And so it always like, like asks this question of whether it is just because there are less women doing this. And I think the answer is probably yes and no. Like on some level, yes, because we are socialized against risk. Like we learn at a very mm-hmm. young age you know, there's a lot of additional risks for us in this world. Your mom says, don't go out at your night, like watch your drink, avoid that man, blah, blah, blah. So you adopt a caution in all right. things. Um, whereas guys are told like, don't be a pussy and like have to adhere to the standard <laughs> of bravado. Um, yeah. So when people hear that I'm doing this, they actually think there might be something wrong with me. Like my um, psychiatrist thought it might be a symptom of mania. And I wonder oh. if I were a man, like if he would have just considered that like an unorthodox or nerdy interest, I'm not sure. Um, right. But I think that like, even within the community in some ways, and I like this other women can correct me if this is not their experience, but I felt that it can affect how we connect with other people. Like you hear horror stories about 
woman explorer is being asked to explore with a guy who then starts making like offhand jokes about like murdering them and like murdering yeah. her in the places he's brought her to. Um, and like, I've had some guys in the past, like slide into my DMS, very interested in exploring together. And then in how they speak to me about it, it's very clear that like, they're hoping to make a little date um, and not that right. they feel they have something to learn from me and yeah. like shoot your shot respectfully. But uh, I think men in the scene probably rarely have to wonder if someone's interest is in actually exploring with them. Um, yeah. And then I think that like in our contributions are also like kind of devalued in some ways, depending on what they are. Like I followed girls on Tumblr who took this like very beautiful, ethereal, haunting photography of like, you know, girls wearing ribbons and lace dresses in like abandoned places and looking like dolls. And that could be seen as very like frivolous and trivial and not real art right. in the way right. that other people make it. Um, and especially this is true if like a woman takes photos that include herself or her body. Um, and there's always mm -hmm. like the politic of like, these kind of like boudoir photographers who go into places and they take their like lingerie photos on the big abandoned yeah. staircase and the comment that it's like attention seeking um and maybe it's just photography and it's not that deep and maybe it is for views like what are the rest of you doing you're trying to get views yeah. too um, <laughs> so in short i do think there are probably numerically fewer of us but also that we do exist and it would be helpful to recognize our contributions even if they look different than men's contributions um yeah and i also like appreciate being brought on this podcast both as a woman and as, as more of an artist than an influencer to show that there are many different ways to go about this it's not that the one route is like you start exploring and then you have a youtube channel and i hear a lot of like resentment also from people who have been on youtube for a long time being like it's getting diluted with all these like you know wacko <laughs> kids who just throw up a video and whatever um, yeah yeah and i think there should be more women explorers because on the flip side of these barriers is the advantage that i won't deny um, which is that as a woman, it can be easier to get out of things if you are caught. Totally. Totally. <laughs> I have seen that. And, you know, when, when a man gets caught, it's typically, you know, a little bit of a different experience than when a woman gets caught and she can kind of sweeten this sort of way out of it. <laughs> yeah. And I've, I have played into that and probably will forever. Like, I don't know who it was who said, like, if you're caught, the best things to have with you are a camera and a girl, preferably. And a girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, you talk about other, you know, other women in the hobby. And like, I remember um, one of my best friends, Rhythm Rider, uh, he started hanging around with Zenning with Zay quite a yes. few years back. And, and I remember getting to know her a little bit at the same time as well. And she was doing some really hardcore stuff. Yeah. And it's funny, Rhythm Rider made a bit of a controversial comment in our episode. And he said that women aren't doing much in this hobby. And when he said that, I'm like, <laughs> but I, I kept it in. Yeah. yeah, I kept it. I kept it in. And, but he was complimenting Zenning with Zay for, you know, she's, she was pretty hardcore and she still is. And she was doing crazy places that not a lot of people were doing. And uh, I, I don't, I don't at all discount women in, in the hobby. And mm. especially looking through your stuff, your stuff has such a different depth to it. You know, like you put so much more thought behind your your captions and behind your your ideas and your concepts behind what you're doing with things that, you know, a lot of guys are just posting over processed pictures with, you know, um, what what was I trying to what was the word I was just kind of going to say predictable captions, you right. know, like, you know, I, I absolutely hate when someone posts a picture of a church and then they use the lyrics to the song. Take me to church. It's my absolute biggest like i fucking hate when people do that and it's like of course you use that stupid lazy caption you're not lazy <laughs> and uh yeah you're you're very your 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 feed is very well put together and you can see going through your feed like you're just the 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 depth of how far you go and and you've just gone to so many cool places and and you have such an eye for the hidden things like to find and to find these letters and to find these tapes and where someone like me would just look at that and say, Hey, that's cool. You actually pick it up and read it and you put a story behind it. And it's, uh, it's, it's really interesting. And, and I, again, I do highly recommend people go and check out your feed and dig deep into what you're doing. The last thing I wanted to ask you about is you, uh, you know, you, you mentioned this in passing, like it's no big deal, but that you rode across Canada and slept in abandoned buildings. <laughs> 
Yeah. Like, <laughs> that's not no small feat. So let's hear about this. What did you do? Why did you do it? And what was it like? Yeah. Okay. So road across Canada is an exaggeration. I did ride to the other end of the country. Um, 3,000 kilometers, right? Yes. From Toronto to Halifax, which was 3,000 kilometers, went through Ontario, okay. Quebec, New Brunswick, PEI, and down through Nova Scotia. Um, over the course of two months, I okay. trained a grand total of zero days. And I spent zero dollars on accommodation the whole time. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, all I had was like a camping stove and a little tent and a dream baby. I just hit the bricks. Um, and wow. it was at a time in my life. Um, last summer where a lot of things were changing all at once. Um, you know, the, the big shift that can happen sometimes in your mid to late twenties where you're like, you know, the version of yourself or the understanding of yourself that you had when you were like in university or like having your first big girl job, um, is being right. challenged by like other, um, circumstances. So, um, it was a time of a lot of thought, uh, and time to myself. And I was writing a poetry collection on the road about, like madness and like queer womanhood through the setting of all these places I was visiting. So okay. um, yeah, abandoned houses and abandoned places ended up being a huge resource to me on that trip um, because they're everywhere and it's free camping. So uh, right. I wouldn't put up my tent inside of an abandoned house just because they kind of smell weird, but like the yards were great. Like I remember when I was in um, like very, very early on the trip um, in Prince Edward County, I found an abandoned house that had like its own little beach behind it. And I was just like, damn, people pay good money for a private beach front in Prince Edward County. And here I am, the house is like trash. There's raccoons everywhere, but like, I'm chilling. Like, this is great. Um, yeah. Yeah. And like uh, uh, graveyards are another great resource if you're a cyclist, because every one of them mm -hmm. has like a freshwater tap to wash your dishes. Right, right. Yeah. So there's a lot of that. Wow. tricks. I ended up, um, even though I plan to do a lot of camping, being inside most like almost 50 percent of the time just through the generosity of people that i met um and everyone asks you like 100 times a day what you're doing and where you're going when your bike is just loaded up with stuff so <laughs> a lot of times people would say like where do you sleep oh don't sleep in a graveyard like just come to my backyard and then when they get a feel for who you are say like okay well don't sleep in the backyard just like come in and then if you build a relationship mm. with that person, they set you up with someone down the road. Like, oh, wow. where are you headed next? Oh, I know someone in Quebec City who I can, you know, pass you along to. Um, so it's beautiful. I met a lot of really amazing people who, like, share a very adventurous spirit. Um, and the number one thing I want people to know is it's not that deep. Like, it's not that serious. Like, yeah. you can actually do it. <laughs> like, it's, I think you think that you have to have some millionaire bike and be an Olympic athlete um, mm -hmm. to do something like that. But like, I just took it slow. Like I'm not very fast. I biked however much I felt I could in a day and then just rested. And I, I had time, which is the biggest resource and all the things that come with time, you know, being like, you know, but I, like, I didn't spend a lot of money. Um, and I, I didn't, I hurt myself because I just paced myself as best I could. So, um, yeah. You're a I, female I, Forrest Gump. Sorry. You're a female Forrest Gump. That's what oh, you are. Oh, thank you. I try, to the, I try to be female Ferris Bueller is, is where I'm trying to go because he was a sneak artist as well. So so tell me, so what is the, um, uh, what's the ultimate end result of this bike tour? Uh, is there going to be writings from it? Is there going to be, like, what's, uh, was it just for the hell of it or? Yeah, in some ways, people were always asking me, like, is this for charity? Like, is this for some sort of great social purpose? And I was like, it's for the memes, baby. Like, I'm trying to just have a great time and, like, learn mm -hmm. something. And there's, there, there's so many things I can say I learned. Like, the fact that I went on this hero's journey and I thought that I might learn a lot about my independence. And what I ended up learning was a lot about interconnectedness. Like, a lot of people offered a lot to me and a lot of trust. And I also put a lot of trust in people and was really surprised um, at what I got back. Like it was totally hope restoring. Um, and also like to never take advice from people who haven't done it and it being whatever right. it is you want to do in life. Like people who had never considered this said like, that's expensive. That's dangerous. That's not possible for you as a woman. You know, you'll hurt yourself. You'll run out of money. Oh. And I was like, yeah, okay, but point me to the people who have done this before. Cause they want to tell me how, and those people did. Um, right. 
yeah and so I hope to like have a poetry collection at the end it's still in the works because I'm trying to do some visual stuff with it yeah. too um okay. but uh, yeah besides that I've just I've my biggest um outcome of that has been the evangelism of trying to encourage other people to do the same yes that's so so good wow you're very you're very inspiring and i Thank hope you. that um other people who listen to this i'm the same way of just do it just get out and do it you know and figure it out you don't have to have a plan just get out and figure it out so let's wrap up with well what's next because i see there's always something with you and you're always <laughs> up to something and so what's your what are you what are you setting your sights on next hmm well, you know, people are asking me what my, you know, five-year plan is. I really don't even have a five-month plan. Um, no. I live in a state of uh, seeking serendipity, which is, I think, why a lot of coincidental experiences have happened to me. I find myself, like, very open to them, and maybe I'm looking for them, so they find me. Um, yeah. But I'm living at uh, an artist residency center right now on Toronto Island, um, working on some zine stuff and also... Um, yeah, some like personal projects um, and yeah. that finishes up at the end of the summer. And then who knows? So if someone listening to this has an idea for me of where to go and what to do, <laughs> hit me up. Um, but I am working on another zine that might be of interest to um, urban explorer type people, which I'm calling tentatively. Um, I, I like, okay, I'm balancing two titles, the ethical sneak or the sneak Bible, because hmm. sneaking into places is also another big interest of mine. Um, yeah. And I have kind of my 10 rules to sneaking in that um, are 10 practical skills that I think people could use. Okay. Oh, so there's so much going on. And now I'm so happy to know you and I'm so happy to follow along because there's so much to look forward to. So uh, I will wrap up by saying uh, thanks to you for joining us. And I'll bring this up again for everyone who's listening, not home, uh, true stories from abandoned places. I'm going to put a link down below so you guys can support Tui and uh and get this in your in your lives and check it out and definitely follow her on instagram go way back to the very first post and then work your way up and uh, i think you'll be really impressed thanks so much for joining us on the podcast this has now probably been one of my favorite episodes so far and you will definitely not be the the last female on this podcast thanks dave really appreciate All it right. back to you. thank you Okay, that was Trespass Everywhere, also known as Tui. I hope you guys liked her interview. I really liked talking to her. She's a super creative girl. Trespass Everywhere, her link is down below. Highly recommend you follow her on Instagram. Now, here we go, guys. It is Urbex Book Club time again, and I'm very excited to read this one because today, usually I only read one subject or one topic from the book, but because some of the things that Tui brought up in the interview I'm going to bring up two different subjects to see what Jeff Chapman had to say in Access All Areas. One of the things that Tui brought up is social engineering. And I'm glad she brought it up because as an urban explorer, depending on uh, the situation you're in, you do have to be really good at social engineering and you've got to be a fast talker. So I wanted to see what Ninjalicious had to say about social engineering in the book Access All Areas. So here we go. All right, so on page 29 of Access All Areas, there is actually an entire chapter or section on social engineering. So I'm just going to read a couple of paragraphs and see what Jeff has to say about that. Hackers use the term to refer to that portion of their craft that deals with talking to people offline, usually over the phone, but occasionally in person, in order to get them to allow access or reveal information about their networks. Explorers use the term the same way. Though most of our social engineering is accomplished in person, social engineering skills come into play when you're talking to an employee in the hope of finding out some information about tunnels, bluffing your way into an event, scamming your way past the front desk, talking someone into holding the door open for you, explaining to a security guard why you're on the roof, and in dozens of other similar scenarios. If you intend to explore where there are people present, you must become at dealing with people and being a fast talker. The next thing is I want to talk about sex, not the act of, but uh, gender. And what, uh, what are some things to take into consideration when you are a female in the hobby of urban exploration or uh, when you're a male in the hobby of urban exploration and how sex comes into play? Um, on page 16 of Access All Areas, here's what Jeff has to say. A nice thing to be, if you are one, 
or a nice thing to bring along if you can get one is a girl. If you are a guy, you may want to ask a member of the fairer sex to come along with you when you explore inhabited buildings, particularly places like churches and hotels. Except in a few scenarios, such as at construction sites or in monasteries, women generally come under much less suspicion than men, since it's a well-documented fact that girls are made of sugar and spice and everything nice. Who would risk getting mud on that? For most people, the idea of a woman deliberately going somewhere she's not supposed to be just doesn't make any sense. Capitalize on this ignorance. At the risk of making broad generalizations, women are also nice to have along since they tend to be better at fast talking than men and they tend to have better instincts and intuitions than men. Trusting my own intuition and the intuition of others, especially women, has saved me from bad situations on multiple occasions. So, Jeff says... To use women as a prop, <laughs> if you've got a group of, you know, three bearded, tattooed men all dressed in black carrying backpacks, a property owner or a security guard does tend to get a little bit more harsh uh, than they would when they approach a group that also has a very nice girl <laughs> that happens to be with them. So so that's it for Urbex Book Club. That's what Jeff Chapman had to say in Access All Areas about social engineering and about the opposite sex being females. Again, like I keep saying, there is a link down below to pick up this book down below off of Amazon. If you're an urban explorer and if you're serious about the hobby, I highly recommend you read this. I am now on my fourth time going through this book. And that's a wrap on episode eight. Thanks so much to Tui, also known as Trespass Everywhere, for joining us on this episode. Thanks to you guys for being here and for listening. I will say it again, link down below to pick up this zine from Tui called Not Home, Stories from Abandoned Places. Very, very well written. You can see that Tui has a background in poetry and literature. She's a very good writer. Check it out. Follow her on Instagram, at Trespass Everywhere. Her links will be down below as well. Uh, I was supposed to be doing my interview yesterday with a lawyer, but lawyers are lawyers and they're very busy. So she's had to put uh, that uh, appointment off. So we will speak to her eventually. I just don't know when. So that's it. All my links are down below, guys. If you're new to the podcast, check out all my past episodes. And if you're able to, guys, on Apple Podcasts, please go and give me a five-star review if you like the podcast. Give some notes, give me the five stars, drop a comment, let the people know what you think of my podcast if you like it. So that's it today, guys. Thanks a lot. Episode eight. See you guys next week for episode nine. Peace.